Uh, great to be here. It's great to meet a group of people that I get to geek out about um, technical stuff with. So the, the Roots of Progress is the name of my blog, and um, I'm focusing on it a little more uh, full time now, but uh, for for the last couple of years, it's been a side project for me. And you know, it started out as just a thing I did. At a certain point, I started to realize that this is actually my hobby. People would ask me things like, so do you have any hobbies? And I would be like, um, uh, economic history? Is that a hobby? <laughs> I don't know. And I always felt like such a geek because it's like, you know, it's like research is my hobby. I don't know. But uh, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised every time, and it was surprisingly often that somebody, you know, that I would tell somebody about the blog and say, oh, what do you, what do you blog about, you know, as your hobby? And I would say, well, it's like the history of industry and technology. And they would say, that sounds so cool. Um, and I got that a lot more often than I was expecting. Um, so great to be in a room full of people who all think that industrial history sounds really cool and you're willing to give up your evening for it. Thank you all. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's dive in. Metalworking is one of the oldest crafts. Uh, it goes back well before recorded history. Uh, in fact, historical ages are defined in terms of metals, right? We talk about the Bronze Age, the Iron Age in archaeology. Uh, the first metal in widespread use, though, was not iron. It was copper. Um, Iron in the Bronze Age was, uh, was very rare and was really only known in, uh, to humanity in one form. And that form is meteorites. So meteors that fell to Earth uh, sometimes contained in them metallic iron. And you can imagine uh, you know, some ancient human and there's this you know, enormous thing that falls from the sky like a gift or perhaps death from the gods. And it crashes into Earth and you know, it looks like a big rock and you go up to it and you start beating it you know, or chipping away at it, right, with your tools like you would a rock. And instead of flaking or chipping off like a rock does, it actually, it's malleable, right? It, it bends, it deforms, you can, and you find that you can work it uh, by pounding it with tools. That's iron. Um, that must have seemed very, very strange to the ancients. Um, so this here is a dagger that was buried with uh, Pharaoh Tutankhamun of Egypt. Uh, by analyzing the nickel content of the iron in here, uh, researchers have determined that this probably came from meteorite. Uh, and in fact, um, ancient words for iron in like Egyptian, Sumerian, basically translate to metal from heaven. Uh, today, of course, iron and steel are everywhere. Right? They're in buildings, um, in you know, steel girders. They're in vehicles, cars, ships, trains, and their rails. They're in infrastructure, right? bridges, towers, electrical infrastructure, especially transformers. And they're in household objects. Um, and the material that we make today, this iron, is of so pure, so consistent a quality, that it would have been hailed by the ancients as a miracle, a feat of craftsmanship possible only through divine intervention. So what is this material? Why is it so hard to make? And how did it go from mythical to mundane? Let's begin at the beginning. Um, the pre-industrial world used basically uh, six main classes of materials. Stone and wood, of course, were known even to our uh, you know, tribal nomadic ancestors. Uh, with the advent of settled societies, we got crafts. So metalworking, pottery, glass blowing, weaving. Right. So the basic materials, stone, wood, metal, clay, or pottery, glass, and textiles. Now, to understand why any particular material is used for any purpose, uh, I like to ask three basic questions. So one, is it suitable for the job? Does it have the right material properties to do what you want it to do? We make different things out of different materials because of their properties. Um, you would not want to make a hammer out of wood. right? It's too soft. You wouldn't want to try to make a, a backpack out of stone. It's too heavy and too hard. You wouldn't want to make uh, straws out of paper. <laughs> um, another uh, you know, slightly less obvious criterion is 
can you make the thing into the right shape? So different materials, again, because of their properties, uh, are manufactured in different ways and can be easily or you know, more or less easily made into the desired shape through different uh, means. Wood is carved and sanded and, and sawed, right? Uh, metal can be you know, pounded or cast. Um, glass needs to be blown. Stone is chipped and polished. Uh, and then finally, what does it cost? And we'll be returning to that later uh, with steel. So of all of these uh, ancient materials, really only two are hard enough to hold uh, a cutting edge for things like tools and weapons. Uh, and that's stone and metal. Uh, but stone, as I mentioned, is brittle. So it can be only shaped only by chipping and polishing. Um, and uh, the other problem with it is if it takes abuse, uh, it's liable to just shatter or fracture. Right? Metal, being more malleable, being more elastic, can be shaped uh, with tools by working, by pounding and hammering. And if it does take abuse, it's more likely to just dent uh, or scratch. You might be able to repair it, or it might still be usable even in slightly damaged form. So uh, because of metal's strength, it makes a good structural material. Because of its hardness, it's good for tools, again, especially those with a cutting edge. And because of its resistance to heat, it's good for things like engines, or for that matter, cooking utensils. Uh, and iron is the strongest metal of them all. That's why it's so important. Um, so where does iron come from? One thing I've learned in my research is that there's really no such thing as a quote unquote natural resource. Or another way to think about it, um, all resources come to us in a highly inconvenient form. They're never exactly the, the form that we want them in. So iron is abundant in the Earth's crust, but not in raw metallic form. Uh, instead, iron is found in the form of ore. And to get the elemental iron out of the ore, to get the metal, uh, you need to take it through a process called smelting. Now, when I started this research, I had a hilariously incorrect uh, conception of what smelting is. And so this is kind of what I thought. I was like, OK, ore is a rock, right? Um, and I guess it has the metal in it, so it must be in these little pockets uh, of metal inside the ore. And then I know that to, to get the metal out, you have to heat it. So maybe you build like a fire, and then you kind of bake the rock over the fire, and then the metal like melts and drips out. And then, whoops, I guess you better you know, get a pan to like, catch, <laughs> catch the metal as it drips out of the rock, right? This is, this is what I thought smelting was. OK, this is completely wrong. Um, please uh, do not take this image of smelting away from this talk. Uh, it's a complete misconception. OK, iron, uh, smelting is nothing like this. In fact, ore is nothing like this. Well, it's a little bit like this. This is iron ore. So it is a rock. I was right about that much. Uh, but the metal is not in little pockets uh, in the rock. Instead, uh, the metal is actually oxidized. So this is a particular form of iron ore. You see it's got this reddish color, kind of rust colored. That's not a coincidence. Um, it's basically iron oxide. Uh, and uh, when, metal, when iron rusts, it's essentially chemically turning back into ore. So uh, you take some of this iron ore, and you crush it up, and you combine it with charcoal. And you put that all into a furnace. So you build a little um, furnace like this, at least about three feet tall. Uh, you, f you, you put alternating layers of the charcoal and uh, iron ore in here. And it helps if you add some lime for, for reasons I'll explain. And then you ignite the entire thing. So you just you set this whole thing on fire. And you let it burn uh, at thousands of degrees for hours. Uh, you give it some air um, kind of in the bottom here. Maybe pump it with a bellows or something. right? And if you get everything just right, a spongy mass of iron will collect at the bottom. And you can open the furnace. Maybe you might even need to break open the furnace, depending on how you built it. And you can it's red hot, but you can take it out with tongs. And uh, this mass of iron is called a bloom. And so this type of furnace is often called a bloomery. Um, now, remember I mentioned natural resources are always inconvenient. Uh, and iron ore is no exception. So not only does the iron itself not come to you in pure form, but even iron ore is not itself uh, pure. The iron ore comes mixed with lots of other stuff. 
crap that you don't want, um, contaminants and impurities like sulfur or phosphorus. And uh, if these impurities, even a tiny amount of them, get into the metal itself, it can make the metal weak and brittle. You don't want that. So part of this melting process, you need to remove the impurities. That's actually what the lime is for. The lime can combine with uh, the impurities, and it forms a waste material called slag, which is lighter than the iron, and you can run it off. Um, but when you get the bloom, a little bit of slag is still in the bloom. And so the first thing you need to do is you take this, uh, this rough mass and you pound it with a hammer. And you, you know, as, through that process, you pound the slag out of the bloom. And you're also kind of smoothing out um, the bloom. And uh, after a little while, you've got a usable lump of pretty pure iron. Now, of course, um, you don't want a lump of iron. You want a thing. You want a, a fork or a belt buckle or a horseshoe or a sword or whatever you're making. right? So you need to now work uh, the iron into shape. And uh, fortunately, the iron is relatively soft. I mean, for a metal. It's, uh, and it can be pounded with tools. So this is what a blacksmith does. Uh, a blacksmith takes the, the, um, the iron after it's been smelted and forms it into a useful thing um, by hand with tools. Uh, so this is an anvil. If you pound against the flat part of the anvil, it flattens out the metal. If you pound against the curved horn of the anvil, um, you can put a bend in the metal. Right. Um, and because this form of iron is worked with tools, it is referred to as wrought iron. That's what the term wrought iron means. Um, so the problem with this is that uh, the iron is actually too soft than is ideal for many purposes. It's, uh, it's even a little bit softer typically than bronze, which was the, the alloy of copper and tin that was used uh, before iron was even discovered. Um, you know, that's okay, for, that's okay for a lot of purposes, but uh, you know, if you need a fork or something, it doesn't need to be that hard. But if you're going to make a sword, you know, if you're going to go out on the battlefield with your sword and, and fight in a war, you don't want your sword to be like a little bit soft, right? <laughs> you don't want it to be softer than the other guy's sword when you like clash, right? You want his sword to be the one that breaks, not yours. So um, ancient blacksmiths discovered ways to make the iron harder. So uh, one thing they found was that if you take the iron and you heat it again in a bed of charcoal, that will start to make the, uh, that will start to make the outside of it so uh, hard. Uh, the skin of the iron or the case uh, will become hard. Um, and this hardened form of iron is called steel. I'll redefine steel later, but for now, certainly in the ancient world, this is essentially what steel is. It's this hardened form of iron. Um, so you heat it in charcoal, and that hardens it. That's good for making a cutting edge, like on a sword or a, a knife or anything. Um, and then uh, they found that uh, it's even better if, after you've done this, uh, instead of letting the iron cool, uh, slowly in the air, if you cool it quickly by plunging it into a barrel of water or oil, this is known as quenching. Um, in fact, when you do this, it can become hard, but it can also become brittle. Uh, and so to make it a little less brittle um, and a little less hard, but uh, to give it some more toughness and ability to absorb energy without breaking, uh, you can then put it back in the fire and heat it up a bit, but not quite as much as before. Uh, and so that's called tempering. And you might have heard, if you've ever read about ancient blacksmiths or read a fantasy novel or something about quenching and tempering. OK, so that can get the outside of the metal hard. Uh, but it doesn't get the metal hard all the way through. So what are some methods for that? Well, uh, one thing you can do is you get a lot of thin strips of iron and harden their surface. And then you can kind of pound them all together, um, weld them together just by you know, pounding under heat. Uh, so you've pounded a bunch of thin strips, and that gets you something that has more hardness all the way through. It also gets you these nice aesthetic patterns uh, from the different strips, and so this technique is called pattern welding. Uh, in Japanese sword making, by the way, there was something uh, simple, uh, similar. You may have heard about pounding the metal flat and then folding it over on itself, and then pounding it flat again and folding and doing this many, many times, um, and that's a similar technique. Uh, but even this doesn't get you something that's truly homogenous, right? 
you've got these kind of layers of, of hardness. If you really want something that's very consistent and hard all the way through, um, you want this, this really high quality steel, you needed uh, other techniques for that. So one technique was similar to the uh, technique of baking in charcoal, but you just did it for like a lot longer period, weeks on end. Um, and that was called the cementation process. This is a cementation furnace um, that would be used to do that. And the product of that was called blister steel. Uh, in ancient India, they had a process that, um, uh, where they would actually melt the iron in crucibles. And they would melt it together with other materials. Uh, and together it would form a, uh, a very high quality consistent steel. Uh, this Wootz steel, it was called, was shipped from India to Damascus in Syria and made into legendary swords. In fact, sometimes it's known as Damascus steel, um, but it was actually Wootz steel from India. Uh, ancient craftsmen liked to hide the sources of their materials because they didn't, they liked to protect their trade secrets. They didn't want anybody, you know, doing what they could do, right? Um, anyway, so these are some Damascus uh, sword makers here. Okay, so that's basically what was known to the ancient world. Let's fast forward to the Middle Ages and look at how this evolved. So that bloomery that I showed you, that small furnace, only produces a small amount of iron. It's not very efficient, um, especially if you're rebuilding the bloomery every time you want to make a heat. Um, you might get 50 pounds of iron out of that. But if you want uh, to be more efficient in your processes, you build a bigger furnace. And so, uh, the furnaces got built bigger and bigger until eventually they were, you know, several stories tall. You can see the people here uh, in this gives you a sense of scale and you can, you can see how big this furnace was. Um, and uh, the bigger a furnace gets, the more air it needs. So you start pumping more air into it with uh, a larger bellows and then more bellows. Um, uh, at one point they would build furnaces into the hillside and take advantage of the breeze, natural breeze kind of blowing in there. Um, but eventually, this gets big enough that you can't pump it by hand anymore, and so you need a powered bellows. And then you would build your uh, smelting uh, uh, factory on a river. Uh, it's a little tough to see, but right in the middle here is a water wheel. So this was on the river. Uh, this part here is where the furnace um, would be that you just saw in the previous dra drawing, and uh, the smoke's coming out the top. Um, so the, the water wheel here is pumping the bellows. Um, and so uh, a furnace this large that needs a, a strong blast of air is known as a blast furnace. But something happens uh, to the metal. As the furnace gets bigger and hotter and uh, the, uh, the, the metal is in there for longer and longer periods of time and higher temperatures, the iron begins to melt. And um, when the melted iron would run out of the furnace and then eventually it would cool, it had a problem. If you tried to pound it with a hammer and work it the way you worked the bloom or the wrought iron, you would find that it was brittle. The melted iron would actually just crack and break under the hammer. It couldn't be put through the normal process. Uh, so at first, it was actually kind of a nuisance. It was considered a botched product. There's really nothing you could do with it except throw it back into the furnace and melt it, you know, remelt it down and hope it came out better this time. But eventually, somebody figured out that if you couldn't work uh, this liquid uh, metal with tools, there's something else you can do with liquid metal. You can cast it. You can pour it into molds. And so uh, this form of iron, the, the molten iron that comes out of this larger type of furnace, is known as cast iron. And many products were made out of cast iron uh, during the religious wars, uh, the 15 and 1600s. Cannon and cannonballs were a very popular uh, thing to make out of, uh, out of cast iron. Church bells as well. Um, and so this cast iron started being made in Europe sometime between uh, maybe the 10th and 15th centuries or so. Um, it was being made in China, by the way, far earlier than that. I think possibly as early as like 5th or 6th century BC. Um, so like a lot of things, including gunpowder and the compass and everything, China actually gets credit for being first. But as far as I can tell, they didn't, it didn't actually influence the development of iron in, in the West. And so it doesn't quite tie into the story of the Industrial Revolution. But give credit where due there. Um, okay, so we've got uh, this wrought iron, which is a little soft. And then we have this cast iron, uh, which is hard but brittle. 
Um, so just like there were ways to harden the wrought iron, there were also ways to refine the cast iron and to take away some of that brittleness and to make it uh, softer like, uh, like wrought iron or steel. So one method to do this was called, uh, during the Industrial Revolution, was called puddling. Uh, so this is the kind of furnace that it was done in called a reverberatory furnace. The key thing about this furnace is that the fuel and the, uh, the iron itself are in separate chambers. So the fuel would be like down here and then the iron you're heating would be here in the middle. And they didn't come into contact. So any impurities in the fuel couldn't adulterate the iron product. Instead, heat would radiate off of this curved ceiling. Um, the other thing uh, that would happen in puddling is you would actually stir it. So here's a couple of really grainy old photographs. In the first one, uh, this guy is holding an ingot of cast iron, uh, known as pig iron, is what the ingots were called. He's about to throw it into the furnace there. And then in this one, it's hard to see, but he's got a long pole in his hands. And he's standing there, and he's actually turning the ingot with the pole and like stirring the molten uh, iron um, so as to expose it to the air and speed up the refining process. Um, so this is a really crappy job, by the way. I mean, you had to literally stand next to the furnace um, for hours on end, right? And sort of, it's, it's obviously, it's extremely hot there, right? It's very uncomfortable. But you're, you're doing this with the pole. Um, and so what would come out of this would be a softer, uh, uh, or, a, or sorry, still a very hard iron, but less brittle than the cast iron. So we have all these processes, right? Um, I've given you a lot of information here. It might be a little hard to hold in your head. I know it was for me. So let me, um, let me kind of recap and summarize for you in a diagram. We start with iron ore. And then we can, uh, we can smelt it in a small furnace like a bloomery to get wrought iron. And then we can harden it to get steel. Or we can smelt it in a larger blast furnace, which will give us cast iron. And then if desired, we can refine it to get steel. That's the summary, essentially, of what we just went through. And, uh, that wrought iron is soft and malleable, whereas the cast iron is hard but brittle. Steel is kind of the sweet spot in between. So what is going on with all of these processes? Like, this is pretty complicated. And for thousands of years, nobody really understands any of the any scientific principles behind this. They don't know any of the chemistry. They're doing everything by trial, error, and lore. They are just, they're just trying stuff, and uh, they have their own experience to go by, but they really don't know what's going on inside the metal, uh, and they don't know why any of these processes do what they do. So, you know, is something being added to the metal to turn it into steel, or removed, or maybe rearranged, you know, inside? And if, and if there is some foreign substance that's getting into the metal, what is it? And where is it coming from? Is it coming from the air? Is it coming from the fuel? Is it coming from the heat itself? You know, in this period, there was, a, there was a time when people thought that heat might be some type of fluid. So you might even think that the heat was like a substance that's getting into the metal somehow. Well, there were lots of theories. Aristotle thought that steel was a purified form of iron. Uh, and he thought that when you went through that hardening process, you were getting the dross out of there and it was getting more pure and therefore more hard. That's not a bad theory. Uh, you know, the, the more pure substance is, more, is stronger, right? You might think that. Uh, impurities weaken a thing. But uh, like a lot of pre-scientific theories, this was wrong. The right answer would wait until the 18th century in the science of chemistry. So uh, a French chemist, uh, Ray Amour, did experiments uh, with iron. He actually melted iron in crucibles with like a lot of different kinds of things, and then he saw what came out. And uh, Ray Amor didn't quite unlock the secret of iron, but he did figure out that steel is not pure iron, it's dirty iron. He figured out that something was getting into the iron. He thought it was sulfurs and salts, but he, he knew there was some sort of contaminating material that actually made it harder. Uh, this guy, T.O. Bergman, in 1781, uh, sometimes called the father of analytical chemistry, he, so he analyzed the iron and was able to isolate uh, the substance that was getting into it to harden it and make it into steel. 
And he identified that substance as phlogiston. <laughs> now, a few people are laughing because you know that uh, phlogiston was a substance that was hypothesized to be in all combustible materials. It was supposed to be the source of combustion, like where combustion came from. And uh, when materials combusted, they supposedly released phlogiston into the air, which then filled up with phlogiston until it couldn't hold anymore. And that's when the combustion ended. Uh, so there was just one tiny flaw in Bergman's theory about steel, which is that the phlogiston model of combustion is false and phlogiston does not exist. <laughs> uh, but a few years later in 1786, uh, three Frenchmen of whom I can only find pictures of two, sorry, Vandermond, um, these guys figured out that uh, the, the substance that Bergman had isolated was actually carbon. So at last, the mystery was solved. It turns out the very substance that was part of the fuel that we were using to smelt uh, the iron and to heat it at the blacksmith's forge that very substance is what was getting into the iron and making it harder. So today we know that uh, wrought iron is basically a pretty pure iron with less than about 0.1% carbon content. <coughs> Above about 2.1% of the metal becomes brittle and that's what we call cast iron. Uh, cast iron when it comes out of the, uh, of the forge has actually a little over 4% typically um, carbon. And that sweet spot in the middle, the kind of Goldilocks material is steel. Um, so but above about 0.1% and less than about 2% uh, carbon is, is what makes us steel. Uh, we also know that iron ore is actually iron oxide. Uh, and there's different forms of it. So you can have uh, you know, different sort of chemical um, configurations of iron and oxygen. Uh, but th that's basically what ore is. And we know also that uh, during smelting, iron ore combines with carbon monoxide from the partially combusted fuel uh, and the carbon monoxide strips off the oxygen, leaving you with elemental iron. Uh, we also know that at high temperatures, high enough to melt the iron, iron actually goes through a, a phase change and uh, its properties change. It becomes a lot more able to absorb carbon. So the wrought iron at the lower temperature does not absorb carbon, but the, but the, uh, the liquid iron does. And that's why when it pours out of the, uh, the, the blast furnace, it's got that higher carbon content, and when it cools, it's more brittle. So um, the hardening process then that blacksmiths were going through is a process of adding carbon, and the refining process, as in puddling, is removing carbon. Uh, but again, the refining processes that we have circa about 1850 are very inefficient. Take days to weeks to refine cast iron into rot. Um, so how can we more efficiently remove the carbon? Enter Henry Bessemer. So Bessemer thought a lot about this problem in the 1850s. You can see in this picture, he's thinking very hard. <laughs> um, he knew that carbon was the mystery element that had been proved at least 50 years before. Um, he also knew that oxygen, from basic chemistry principles, he knew that oxygen readily unites with carbon and could potentially strip it away. And he knew that existing Refining methods exposed the metal to the air. It's part of how they worked. So in this context, his breakthrough is actually quite simple. Almost seems obvious in retrospect. What if we just used a lot more air? And this is what the Bessemer process is. So he designed this uh, vat called the Bessemer converter. This is a diagram of it. It's this uh, huge egg-shaped metal vat that holds molten iron. And down here are toyers, which is a fancy term for like little nozzles. Uh, and, you, and air was pumped through this part into the bottom and then up through the bottom and air was forced uh, through the molten iron. Here's an actual photograph of one. Uh, it's pretty huge. It's pretty steampunk actually. I like it with all the rivets and everything. I really like that. And, uh, and so when Bessemer first tried this, he, uh, so he puts, pours the metal into his vat, pumps the air through it, and boom! Flames shoot out of the, this is violent demonstration. Flames shoot out of the, the vat. It erupts like a volcano. Uh, and it burns like that for like 20 minutes. And that is all of the carbon very rapidly oxidizing. And what used to take days or weeks, you know, in other furnaces, was basically reduced to about a 20-minute uh, process of oxidization. 
Now, a faster process is a cheaper process, and the, the Bessemer process reduced the cost of iron dramatically by about 80%. So your money could now buy, uh, you know, like five times as much steel as it, as it used to before Bessemer. And this was a revolution uh, in manufacturing and construction. So uh, cheap steel hit the world just in the age of railroads. It was, uh, and it was extremely useful. So it was useful for the locomotives themselves building the boiler. A stronger boiler could hold higher pressures and therefore a more powerful locomotive. But it was really useful. It was indispensable for the rails themselves. So the rails could not be made out of, out of cast iron because again, cast iron is brittle and under, you know, rails, iron rails uh, of a railroad are under, uh, they take a tremendous amount of abuse, right? You've got entire trains rolling over them multiple times a day. Uh, so cast iron rails would just break, and a broken rail is a disaster. It's a literal train wreck. Uh, so the rails had to be made out of wrought iron. But because the wrought iron is relatively soft, under all that abuse, they would wear out. In fact, on some particularly heavy, uh, heavily trafficked sections of track, the rails were wearing out every few months. So think about that. They've got crews of men out there, like every three months, replacing entire sections of rail. Very inefficient. Um, when cheap steel came along to be mass produced, uh, they replaced the wrought iron rails with steel rails, and the steel rails lasted for years. Much more efficient. Steel was also used in construction. Uh, so uh, st uh, stronger metal could form the skeleton of a building, and it could hold the weight of the building instead of the weight having to bear down upon the masonry. Uh, and with this, we could build much higher. It ushered in the era of skyscrapers. Uh, and we were also able to uh, open up a lot more of the wall spaces to windows because, again, not, not as much of it was needed to hold the weight. Another crucial application was in uh, agriculture. The steel plow was invented by the original John Deere, founder of the John Deere company. Um, this, was his, this was his original invention that he sold to farmers. And, uh, and the steel plows helped break up the tough prairie soil of the Midwest. Today, steel is everywhere. Without it, the modern world would be unrecognizable. Just try to imagine New York City without its iconic skyline. Imagine cars made of wood. <laughs> imagine that all of our food had to come packaged in heavy, brittle glass jars instead of nice, light steel tin cans. Tin cans, by the way, are steel cans coated with tin. Uh, Powered flight would probably uh, be impossible, and there would definitely be no space program. So the metal may no longer be mythical, but it is still marvelous. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm happy to take any questions. And if we have extra time at the end, I can also say a few words about uh, progress studies, and, uh, which is my new uh, obsession and kind of what, it, what, I, what I think about progress studies and what I'm doing about it. Yeah. Um, so the smelting oh, we've got a microphone for you. Yep. Um, yeah, thanks a, thanks a lot for the talk, first of all. Um, is smelting basically doing those two uh, uh, reduction reactions that you showed? Smelting is uh, going from the iron ore, which is the oxidized form, and doing the reduction uh, essentially through carbon monoxide yep. to get yep. elemental okay. iron yep. out of it. That's exactly. What's yeah, that's what I was actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the magnetite and the hematite. So, yeah. do we have faster ways of doing that now? Um, yes. Um, I mean, do we have faster ways of doing that? So, I mean, that wasn't the slow part of the process. Um, and so uh, it was really the refining um, that was the slow part. We have better ways of doing the refining now. So, in particular, um, uh, there's now something called the basic oxygen process, which uses a blast of pure oxygen kind of sprayed in through a nozzle um, instead of having to just use air, right? Air is only one-fifth oxygen, right? Like, if oxygen is doing the job, you just want, like, pure oxygen sprayed in there. Yeah, so, it, so yeah. now the process is uh, iron oxide to wrought iron to steel. Yeah, so, um, so Bessemer originally, uh, he, he did the process and he didn't... Um, he didn't take all of the carbon out, and so he would run the thing for like a little while, but not completely decarbonize. And that would, but he got most of it out, and so it uh, it created a product called mild steel, 
But they found that it was very difficult to like control the exact amount that you were removing. And so a better process turned out to be just remove all of the carbon, get it down to as pure iron as you can get, and then add back in whatever you want to add in. Now, in modern steelmaking processes, you're not just adding back in carbon uh, because we make a lot of alloys. Uh, so if you alloy steel with chromium, uh, for example, you get stainless steel, uh, which has a lot high resistance to corrosion. If you alloy it with tungsten, you get a form of steel that is very heat resistant, uh, like up to many thousands of degrees. Uh, that is used for tools, uh, especially cutting tools that end up generating a lot of friction. Um, so there's, there's like lots of different things you might mix into the, uh, into the iron. Manganese, vanadium, there's all, I don't even remember what they all do, but there's like many different elements that you might mix in. Uh, and modern processes uh, are extremely precise, right? So they are, uh, the, the alloys uh, are just down to the, I don't remember exactly what the tolerances are, but I think they're around like parts per million. Um, and when you're making steel to order, you, you know, today you're going to order it to like a very precise alloy. Yeah. I'm going to pass the microphone over that way. I have a three part question. <laughs> okay. One at a time. The first part is actually a, a simple one. I think you mentioned all of the dates throughout the talk, but can you quickly recap the timeline again? from first steel to like steel as a very common weapon and then to yeah, steel sure. as a so, building So the tool. Iron yeah. Age begins at different times in different parts of the world. Um, it's typically, um, it's pre-recorded history in many parts of the world, but not all. Um, so uh, I, I don't remember the exact, you know, around like 1000 to 1500 BC or so um, is kind of when it becomes common. Um, and then, um, you know, you've basically got, so you've, uh, let's see. So I'm, I'm trying to think now, when did the, uh, so it was like sort of after the fall of Rome, I think even that the, that the furnaces started to get like a lot bigger, um, uh, in the, in Catalonia, so the Northern part of Spain, uh, there was, there was the region that preserved iron making best after the fall of Rome. You may have heard of the Catalan forge. That was perfected around the 8th century, I think. Um, it's a little unclear when Europeans started making cast iron. Uh, there's some reports of it, it seems, as early as the 10th century. Uh, but definitely by, like, the 1400s, uh, I think there's, there's clearly, like, um, blast furnaces making cast iron. Um, again, China was doing it, like, even way earlier, right? I think there are cast iron implements as old as, like, 5th or 6th century BC in China. Um, and then uh, there wasn't, you know, like the real development started to come around the Industrial Revolution. So uh, 1700s, I, I didn't have time to go into nearly everything here. In the 1700s, the puddling process was created. I think that was 1780s. Um, there was, in the 1740s, a guy named uh, Huntsman uh, was a clockmaker, and he actually rediscovered or reinvented the, the crucible process that was known in ancient India because he wanted very consistent steel for springs to be used in clockwork. Uh, and then the, the chemistry developments were in the 1700s, uh, finally identifying carbon in 1786. Bessemer's process didn't come until the 1850s. Um, and then Carnegie, you know, brought the Bessemer process to America in the 18, I don't remember, 70s-ish. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I'll skip my part two, but I will go straight to part three. Okay. Um, which was, <laughs> I don't know, part two wasn't as interesting. <laughs> and this was a, a great answer. Um, so my part three was, I think, like, as you mentioned this timeline, it seems like there are some moments where, like, necessity is prompting some sort of, like, evolution of the process. My favorite one was when you said, like, hey, a sword needs to break another sword, and who's going to build the best sword? Um, and then some moments were... Technolog technological innovation, like industrial revolution, just sort of speeds everything up. And then my question is, what forces do you think right now are prompting the development of the next evolution of materials, whether it's metal or even maybe there's a seventh type of material that's going to come along? Yes, the seventh type of material, by the way, is plastic. Mm -hmm. And so that was invented basically in the 20th century. Uh, with some precursors in the, yeah. Um, but sure, uh, is there another, um, there may be, 
I'm not actually up on the latest in like current developments in material science. It's probably something with like carbon nanotubes or I don't know what. Um, Ceramics. Or That's possible. Fair. There's a lot, I mean, there's always a lot of stuff going on at the forefront, yeah. Um. You can also talk about like optimization powered, like additive manufacturing, you can come up with, sorry, I was just saying, speculating, optimization powered, like additive manufacturing, where you can come up with like weirder designs for stuff and then 3D print it and cast it that you couldn't do, so computation plus additive, I might guess. Yeah, the definitely. Technological revolution as our equivalent. I mean, so computers have already, I mean, starting in, I think, around the 60s, already started helping make manufacturing processes better. So steel making is all computer controlled now. That's how they get those extreme tolerances for the, you know, for the, uh, for the alloys and stuff. But yeah, the ability to actually um, you know, do some sort of 3D printing or other types of um, uh, you know, one-off like manufacturing of special shapes uh, is is super interesting, as is, by the way, just like computer design of what the shape itself should be. I don't know if you've seen, there's some, there's some really weird looking designs that were found by, you know, essentially some sort of like AI or uh, algorithm or something exploring like a vast state space and, um, and refining things iteratively and getting to a really weird looking, almost organic or very alien kind of design, but extremely strong with very little material, right? Um, I suppose it explains why all my drill bits and such say tungsten carbide yes. uh, on them <laughs> very high temperature. I was curious in the naming of steel, you hear a lot about carbon steel. Yes. Which, you know, if steel by definition is iron with carbon in it, that is what exactly is carbon steel? It that sounds was a bit one redundant. of the most, yeah, that was one of the most confusing things to me when I started researching this. So uh, there's, there's carbon steels, uh, but all steels contain carbon. There's also, you'll hear the term alloy steels except all steels are alloys. Um, so it is confusing. Uh, alloy steel typically refers to uh, something other than carbon as the alloy, right? So like I said, chromium, vanadium. I don't remember exactly where the term carbon steel came from. Um, it probably refers to like a specific range of how much carbon is in there. Um, where a lot of these terms come from is that the terms come around before people actually understand what's going on, right? So some of the terms predate chemistry. Um, I mean, carbon steel would not because they didn't even know what carbon was until the science of chemistry, right? But you get a lot of terms that are, uh, are just confusing because they come from like people, the, the only thing people understood was the process that made the thing, not what it was. They didn't understand, understand its internal or chemical or molecular structure. And so they didn't even know, you know, sometimes you get a thing where two different materials are named different or are named the same thing, or one material has different names depending on how it was produced if it was made by different, you know, processes. Um, Another question, uh, a lot of the steel that we see in consumer goods is actually rolled steel. Yes. That has been worked in some way or another. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious what the process is for, for roll, what's the composition and, and process for rolled steel? Yeah, so I didn't even get into shaping methods, but one of the big things, uh, other things that happened in the Industrial Revolution was coming up with different methods to shape, uh, to, to get the material into the right shape. And rolling is huge. So with rolling, you, you literally have uh, rollers, so cylinders that you can pass the metal through, um, you know, force it through cylinders that are just a little bit tighter together uh, than the size of the metal. And that crunches it and compresses it a bit. And then there's another set of rollers that are just a little bit closer together. Um, it, used to be, it used to be very inefficient because they would have one pair of rollers and you'd have like three guys working it and they would pass it through. And then somebody would like turn a screw a little bit and then they'd pass it through the other way and they'd just be like passing it back and forth. Eventually you got the whole thing automated and there's just like a series of rollers. Um, and it's, it's pretty wild because, of course, every time you um, compress the material a little bit, by conservation of volume, it's getting a little bit longer. And that means it's going through a little bit faster. And so if you're making a very you know, long, thin rod, it goes in relatively slowly. But by the time it's gone through a series of rollers, it's shooting out of there at like a very high um, you know, linear uh, velocity. Um, and these processes were, were perfected um, in the, during the Industrial Revolution. 
Uh, one of the things they found was um, if you want to, uh, so as the, as the steel goes through the rollers, um, the, roll, the pressure actually pushes the rollers outwards a bit. So if you start with straight rollers, uh, they actually kind of buckle, they buckle outwards um, and they create a metal that's not perfectly flat. So what you have to do is actually start with slightly curved rollers and then the pressure will force them flat and then you get very smooth metal. Um, so they experimented with all, all sorts of things and built um, you know, better and better rollers and processes. But yeah, rolling is, is extremely important. It's how, we make, it's how we make bars and beams and sheets and, and all that kind of stuff. What's the alloy they mostly use for that? Is it, is it more of a... I mean, the alloy you're going to use is going to depend on the ultimate um, mm -hmm. desired... Right? I mean, I think many different types of alloys can be rolled. Uh, it would just depend on the ultimate use and application, right? Again, do you want corrosion resistance? Do you want um, temperature resistance? Do you want, right, something else? Is chromium steel and stainless steel the same thing? Uh, I believe so, yeah. I mean, it's possible that there's, there are a number of different alloying elements that can give corrosion resistance. So it's possible that something that is marketed as stainless steel is actually not chromium, but a different element. But um, yeah, those are more or less the same thing. So in the beginning, you said you were going to give us an update on the current status of the project. What's yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to go into that. Are there any other questions about uh, steel? So <laughs> let, me take maybe, uh, let me take maybe one more because I have a few more slides on that. So like, <laughs> um, why, don't, why don't I take one more question on steel, and then I'll talk about progress, and we can called unless you want to chat about progress but yeah go ahead cool so now i'm super excited about smelting cool <laughs> i kind of want to go home and smelt something yeah um, don't i would don't try that at home <laughs> um one question like do you have to like break up the iron ore before smelting it do you grind it in like into small pieces or how's that yeah i think typically that would be done so you would um you would crush it and uh you'd have alternating layers of like ore and um uh, and charcoal or uh, later, they used uh, coke, which is a purified form of coal. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Quick question. So, yeah, sure. uh, why was uh, why was iron from uh, meteorite so attractive? Was it typically more pure? Well, at the time, it was the only form of iron that anyone knew, right? So this is before smelting, before they had figured out how to smelt the ore, or even knew that iron ore contained iron in it, uh, right? They knew the meteorites. Like the meteorites had, had crashed. Yes, correct. So yes, so iron in the Earth's crust is oxidized. It's in the form of ore. But when it falls, yeah, but iron in meteorites is not oxidized. So you get this chunk of metallic iron that just falls from the sky. Yeah. Cool. All right, so um, let me end with a few words about progress and progress studies um, and kind of why I'm doing what I'm doing now. So I got fascinated with the story of human progress, because I see it essentially as a moral imperative. Um, these are, uh, so this is a these are a set of charts from the pro project Our World in Data, uh, which collects data on humanity's biggest problems and our progress against them. So this is, uh, this is what's happened over the last, um, you know, since 200 years plus since 1800, right? Extreme poverty, uh, way down, child mortality, way down, democracy, vaccination, uh, education and literacy all way up. The world is way better off than we were just a couple hundred years ago. Um, and we got to keep this going. But progress is not automatic or inevitable. In fact, for most of human history, we didn't make a lot of progress. So this is world GDP, uh, you know, over the last 2,000 years or so. This is like the ultimate hockey stick. Um, <laughs> our species has had uh, language and in general higher level conceptual functioning for at least 50,000 years, probably longer, uh, that we've had what they call behaviorally modern humans. But most of the progress that we enjoy today, not just technological progress, but science uh, and even our form of government, most of that progress has been made in the last 500 years or less. Right? So about 1% of that time. Uh, the economic historian Joel Muck here points out that the very idea of progress is not a natural idea. Uh, it's a relatively new idea. For most of human history, we had static societies where uh, nobody really thought that anything ever could, would, or for that matter, should change. 
Uh, to make progress, we have to believe that it's both possible and desirable. And I think we know from history, too, that progress can be slowed, it can be stopped, it can even be reversed. It can be lost or destroyed, uh, as during the Dark Ages in Europe. So I think if you care about human life and happiness, health, thriving and flourishing, you have to look at these basic facts of history and ask a few crucial questions. How did we get here? Right? What were the steps of this amazing journey? Why did it take so long? Why did so many generations of people have to suffer and die before we finally unlocked the keys to progress? And how do we keep it going and even accelerate it? And conversely, what could threaten it? What could threaten to slow, stop, or reverse it? We have to understand the causes of progress so that we can protect them and enhance them. Uh, and I would argue that today, progress is actually at risk. One, because most people don't appreciate it enough. Most people don't know how far we've come. Most people don't even know the direction that we're going. Those six charts I showed you, a lot of people think they're actually going in the opposite direction. And I don't blame people, really. They don't get this story in school. It kind of falls between the cracks of history and science classes. They don't get it from the news media, which is like strongly negativity biased. They don't really get it from popular culture, which is increasingly dystopian in recent decades. Uh, and it's very hard to get on your own if you go out and research this stuff. A lot of the sources are very dry and academic, and the popular histories uh, really don't go into a lot of the technical details. They're sort of focused on human drama. They're, they're mind candy, a lot of them. And so uh, when you poll people, you actually find that uh, people don't believe that the world is getting better. They actually think we're in some sort of downward spiral. Even worse, uh, progress is under attack uh, from some quarters and really has been uh, you know, through most of human history. Um, from the romanticism of Rousseau, the back to nature, the noble savage, to today, the anti-tech narratives that are becoming very popular in the media, right? Tech steals our privacy, uh, tech steals our attention, it isolates us from one another. Um, the uh, romantic wing of the environmentalist movement spreads fear about technologies that are actually uh, benign and helpful, like GMOs. Um, you get academics saying things like, agriculture was a mistake, you know, Jared Diamond uh, says that. And we even see the rise of conspiracy theories, like the anti-vaccination movement. Overall, I think there's a growing distrust of elites and institutions, including the elites and institutions that are the basis of human progress, like founders and VCs, uh, or scientists, yeah. <laughs> or scientists in universities, right? I thought I'd get a shout out for founders here. Yeah, that's good. I was more anti-vax. <laughs> Uh, and so I see potential threats to progress, right? I see the potential for populist political movements that could enact policies that would make it harder for us to make forward progress. Uh, when you don't understand where we've come from and how far we've come, right, it's very easy to romanticize the past as some sort of Garden of Eden from which we've fallen. Uh, and when you don't understand the modern world as a set of solutions to humanity's biggest problems, uh, it's easy to propose policies that would amount to unsolving problems that we've already solved. But even more importantly, I think we need the next generation inspired to take part in this story. Right? And if no one tells them the story, and if all they hear are the attacks, then who's going to step up and blaze trails for the next frontier? So I think we need to tell the story of progress and tell it as the story of solutions to problems. Counter the attacks on progress with the truth well-researched, you know, rigorous, empirical, historical truth, and ultimately promote it as a noble quest, especially among young people. So this is what I'm doing with uh, my blog and my, my project, The Roots of Progress. And here's how I think what I'm doing is unique. Um, one, it's written for a popular audience. It's written to be accessible to sort of the, you know, generally intellectually curious layman. I try to give people the big picture, not just mind candy, not little sound bites, but actually help people put everything together into sort of an overall package that you can retain and take away. Um, but I also take a very bottom-up empirical approach 
uh, very historical, try to start with the, the basic facts of just what happened, and tell it all with that problem solution orientation. And I actually, as much as possible, try to go into the technical details of what were the problems and how were they solved. And I try hard to make that accessible to a general audience. So uh, today, uh, I'm writing my blog and I'm giving talks like this one. Uh, soon, I might be experimenting with other media like podcasts or videos, maybe even doing some um, interactive diagrams or simulations or games. Uh, and medium to long term, I'm interested in writing a book and I may even have uh, a whole, this may even turn into a whole series of books. So I uh, encourage you to check it out, rootsofprogress.org. Uh, subscribe and follow me. And uh, I hope you like the content. You can get a lot more of it. Do you have like a sentence definition of progress that you use or that you share with students? Um, yeah, I mean, I, when I talk about progress, I mean it on a fundamentally humanistic standard. So what is good for human life, health, and happiness? Um, so I think of it in three main categories. Technological progress, or, or more broadly, kind of economic production, uh, wealth and our capacity to, to create wealth and control the material world. That's pretty objective and clear. Um, scientific progress, uh, or more generally, growth in knowledge and our understanding of the world. And then kind of the hairiest one is progress in uh, sort of morality, government, and society. Um, but broadly, you know, moving towards a world of more peace and freedom. Inside of every romanticized notion or criticism or backwards uh, no, notion that people have about progress, you can find a kernel of something that technologists or technology can take responsibility for. Because I think there's a there there's a lot of places where progress in technology can, if we actually want people to have a learned and, and, and positive view towards it, there's a lot of responsibility that I think we as technologists can scientists and other people who, who uh, further progress can, can take on. You know, I, the environmental impact of progress is, is something that's immense, and I think that's, that drives a lot of the fear that a lot of people in the world have right now. We're watching progress literally destroy the ecosystem, which is the only one we have. And uh, that, that's something I don't think, as, as a as technologist or as the world, we've done that great a, a job at. I think that would be something that I would love to see, an element that I would love to see integrated into, into the stuff that, that you write as well, that I think social and global responsibility and technology. Yeah, sure. Um, absolutely, people who create technologies, I think, have a responsibility to uh, think about all of their implications, right? Um, some implications can't be foreseen, but, uh, you know, the most common thing that people think about very often is safety, right? Every, every new power generally creates new risks. Um, this, is not a, uh, this is not an indictment of the technology itself. Uh, every, every solution to a problem is going to create new problems. That's the way problems and solutions work. It doesn't mean that the solution wasn't a solution. It just means we've given ourselves new problems to solve. Um, I think that you know, I think that a lot of the history of progress is actually dealing with those problems. Um, so, you know, we create automobiles, but then we also create seatbelts and airbags. Um, we create x-rays, and then when we realize they're harming people, we also create lead shielding. Um, we create nuclear power plants, then we also create containment units. And, uh, you know, we don't always foresee everything right away, uh, and sometimes, uh, sometimes accidents happen. Sometimes people die in order for us to even learn what's harmful. Some of the early experimenters with radiation or with x-rays uh, themselves died of their own experiments. Um, I think those are, I think it's an inevitable chance that we take. And if we didn't take those chances, we'd be back where our primitive ancestors were, you know, facing, you know, facing life and death risks from the wind and the rain 
the weather from wild animals, from you know, from drought, uh, from floods. So um, I think on balance, all of it, you know, I think uh, in the final court of appeals, progress is vindicated and exonerated. But uh, but I agree it's an important topic, especially since uh, it's a very common one for people to think about. And I would love to do a whole thing about like the history of safety technology, right? I would also love to do something about um, what are the things that we actually rolled back? Because every once in a while, we find something and we're like, oh, no, 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 really. Um, I like cocaine. You know? <laughs> we're like, oh, this is like a great thing to put in soft drinks. You know? And then we realized, oh, no, really not. <laughs> right? And we didn't, there's no equivalent of lead shielding where we were like, well, we're still going to use cocaine. But we're going <laughs> to, right? For, we were pretty much just like, no, 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 let's just roll that one back. Wrong, <laughs> wrong path to go down. Back up. Try a different path. And that happens every once in a while, right? Um, so I think it's I think it would be I think it would be really helpful to kind of like do an overview of harm from new things that we discovered. How did we discover it? How long did it take? Are we getting better at finding that faster? Um, and then you know what safety measures do we put in place? What do those look like? And have we gotten better in general at uh, developing and implementing safety measures? All right. Woo. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. This is great. A lot of fun.